What's up, y'all? Welcome back. And we have another episode with Lost Media. I shot an episode about Lost Media about last month or something. I'm not sure which episode it was, but let's hop right in. A while back, I made a video going through five pieces of disturbing lost media that were listed under the Not Safe for Life category on the Lost Media Wiki. That video did really well, so I decided to dive into the NSFL page once again, as I barely even scratched the surface of this particular lost media rabbit hole. I should warn you all that this content may be disturbing to some viewers, so if you're squeamish, I advise you to click off of this video now. For those of you who've stayed, this is nine more pieces of dark and disturbing lost media. Aaron no Ralston's more. Blue John Canyon incident. My name's Aaron Ralston. My parents are down on Larry Ralston of Englewood, Colorado. Whoever finds this, please make an attempt to get it to them. Be sure of it. I would appreciate it. Oh, this homie's, um, Aaron Ralston rocks, is an American no? medical engineer and motivational speaker born in 1976. After working as an engineer for the Intel Corporation for five years, he quit after developing a love for mountaineering and moved to Colorado to pursue a full-time career in this field. On April 26, 2003, the then 26-year-old Ralston was scaling the Blue John Canyon in southeastern Utah. While climbing down a slot canyon, a boulder that he was using to support his weight became dislodged and pinned his right hand against the canyon wall. Despite his best efforts, he couldn't free his arm, and because he hadn't informed anyone that he would be climbing the canyon, he knew nobody would come looking for him. Over the next few days, Ralston was forced to ration his food supply, which consisted of 350 milliliters of water and two burritos, and eventually had to resort to drinking his own urine. During the course of the event, Ralston created a video diary for his friends and family, as he believed he was going to die. After failing to chip away at the boulder with a knife, Ralston decided that he would attempt to amputate his forearm. This proved difficult, however, as the knife could not break through the bone. After five days, Ralston carved his name and the date he predicted he would die onto the wall, and he recorded his last goodbyes to his family. The next day, however, he managed to break his arm using the torque against it. He then managed to amputate his arm using a tourniquet to stop the blood flow and a multi-tool to cut through the muscle tissue and a nerve. And so I, I slammed my body again. Yo, homie is brave. Like, you must really want to live. If you are, you're like ripping your own, your, your own arms. If it's me, I'm just like, yo, please let me be. Like, let me just, it's, it's, it's over. Accept it. That's crazy. Against the opposite wall, I grabbed the backside of the boulder and even got my feet up to where I was, I was standing halfway up the wall and grabbing the backside of the rock and humping my body over it until finally that bottom bone snapped. But I knew that, that was the hard terrible. part. It was only a few more moments of work after that. And then, boom, and I wasn't even attached anymore. And I fell down like this. And I, 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 I was free. You were reborn. <laughs> it, was, it was the happiest moment of my life. And it's, it's funny to think about it being... There, there will never be a more powerful experience for me. After freeing himself, yeah. Ralston rappelled one-handed down the canyon. While attempting to hide back to his car, he encountered a family on vacation from the Netherlands who gave him food and water and alerted the authorities. A helicopter search party happened to pass overhead moments later and picked him up. Ralston was asked in an interview if he would ever make his footage public, and while he understood the intrigue and interest behind the concept, he politely declined, stating that it was a private personal video made for his family and friends and that he intended for it to remain that way. Despite this, one video clip has been released, as well as a compilation of audio snippets taken from different sections of the tape. I've been putting a lot of effort into this thing on. I have very, very little water. My body's having difficulty controlling its temperature. I'm in deep stuff. It's pretty much suicide. It's uh, four hours from here to my vehicle. Climbing would probably be impossible with one hand. The blood loss and my dehydration, I think, um, are ruling that out. I think I would die if I cut my arm. I don't know what it is about me. 
brought me to this, but got out looking for adventure and risk so I can be alive and I'll tell someone where I'm going. It's just dumb. I can't stop thinking about good, grapefruit juice, or margarita, or OJ, or a popsicle. All these great things that I would love to have. An orange. Oh, the tangerine. In 2010, a movie titled 127 Hours, James named after the amount of time that Ralston spent trapped in the canyon, was released starring James Franco. To prepare for the role, Franco and the film's producers were allowed to view the home video footage that Ralston had recorded, and parts of the film's transcript were taken directly from Ralston's video. While I, and I'm sure many others, would like Aaron to make the footage public, I respect his decision to keep it private, as it was obviously a very harrowing experience for him, and the story of his survival should be enough. The Cannibal Holocaust Piranha Scene oh, Cannibal small. Holocaust is a 1980 Italian exploitation horror film directed by Ruggiero Diodata. The film tells the story of a missing documentary crew that was filming cannibal tribes in the Amazon. New York University anthropologist Harold Monroe is sent on an expedition to track down the missing crew. He manages to recover the film crew's lost cans of film, which an American broadcast station wishes to broadcast. Upon viewing the film reels, Monroe is appalled by the disturbing actions of the film crew and urges the station not to broadcast the documentary. Things like this happen all the time in the jungle. It's survival of the fittest. In, in the jungle, it's the daily violence of the strong overcoming the weak. Jack! At the time of the film's release, the found footage genre didn't really exist yet, so it was groundbreaking and is believed to have influenced the found footage movies that came years later, most notably The Blair Witch Project. Cannibal Holocaust mm -hmm. caused a great deal of controversy, not only due to its graphic violence, but also due to on-screen killings of live animals and snuff film allegations that led to Diodata being charged with murder until oh, he was cool. able to prove the stars of the movie were indeed alive. The film was banned in Italy, Australia, Norway and many other countries due to its content, though some bans have since been lifted. Among the many gruesome scenes in the film, another one was scripted that is commonly dubbed the Piranha Scene. In this scene, a single Shamatari warrior injured in battle was to have his leg amputated by warriors of the Yanomamo tribe. The tribe would then tie the Shamatari warrior to a log and lower him into the piranha infested waters, slowly being eaten alive by the fearsome fish. Filming for the scene did commence but was never completed due to the piranhas being difficult to control and the film crew's underwater camera was malfunctioning and only production stills exist. It was rumoured that the scene was included in several obscure foreign video releases but this was proven to be false. The whereabouts of the surviving footage, if any, is unknown. John, I want this material burned. All of it. Yeah. The Columbine Basement Tapes. On April 20th, oh, 1999, shit. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, who were attending Columbine High School, shot and killed 14 students and a teacher before turning the guns on themselves. The incident was dubbed the Columbine Massacre. In December 1999, He's Time Magazine reporter Tim Roach was given access to Y'all see this? Bro, these are really some fucking demons. ...to five videotapes recorded by the murderers that investigators had discovered. Roach published an article for Times on the tapes on December 20th, soon after viewing them, dubbing them the Basement Tapes. Not long after the article's publication, furious family members of the deceased threatened to sue Jefferson County, considering the fact that not even they had been given access to the recordings. They came to an agreement, with Jefferson County quickly screening the tapes for them and then putting them in a vault indefinitely. However, in February 2015, Word surfaced that the unreleased tapes had been approved for destruction by Sheriff Ted Mink of Jefferson County, Colorado in 2011. When an unknown party filed an open records request to view the unreleased tapes, they received a notice that the Sheriff's Office no longer had any documents in its possession responsive to their request. Afterward, a spokesperson for the Sheriff's Office confirmed that the tapes had been destroyed and that no copies are known to exist at all, meaning that the tapes would be lost forever if true. Over an hour's worth of footage made for a class project filmed by the two has surfaced in the years since. The two most notable pieces of footage are Rampart Range, 
which shows them at a shooting range with their friends using firearms, and the second is a student film they made called Hit Men for Hire, where they acted as bodyguards for people who were being bullied. However, once again, the things they say in this video definitely foreshadow what they would do several months later. Rampart Range is completely banned from YouTube due to it violating YouTube's policy on graphic violence, but is available on Daily Motion. Hit Men for Hire, however, is available on YouTube. As for the basement tapes themselves, as stated previously, it seems very unlikely that they will ever be released to the public. Oh, shit. These CEOs started with nothing. But they didn't just climb the ladder. The Japanese Cannibal Audio in the summer of 1981, Issei Sagawa, a Japanese student studying abroad in France, invited classmate René Hardvelt to his apartment for dinner and to study poetry. What culminated was Sagawa's intention to kill Hardvelt and consume her flesh. Sagawa claims that he'd had cannibalistic desires ever since he was a child after seeing someone else's thigh. In 1977, at the age of 27, Sagawa moved to France to pursue a PhD in literature at the Sorbonne in Paris. On June 11, 1981, Sagawa, then 32, invited his classmate Rene Hardbelt, a Dutch woman, to dinner under the pretext of translating poetry for a school assignment. While Hardbelt was reading a Jones Robert Betcher poem about death, he shot her with a rifle. Using an electric oh, knife, shit. he started taking more than several kilos of meat from her body. He consumed her flesh during the next three days, cooking several meals and performing depraved acts with her corpse before finally getting rid of the body. Sagawa recorded the entire incident on tape, including Hardvelt's last words and the actual shot that was fired. He also shot yeah, a total bro. of 39 photographs showing several stagings he made with the corpse. Trying to make her body disappear, Sagawa eventually made a mistake by losing one of the suitcases containing her body parts in a public garden. The police later found the suitcase and arrested the man who was to be called the Japanese cannibal by the newspapers. The rest of Hartfeld's body, the rifle, the photos, and the tape recorder, as well as several other pieces of evidence, were found in his apartment. Sagawa's wealthy father provided a lawyer for his defense, and after being held for two years awaiting trial, Sagawa was found legally insane and unfit to stand trial by the French judge, who ordered him held indefinitely in a mental institution. After a visit by the author Inuhiko Yamota, Sagawa's account of his kill was published in Japan under the title In the Fog. After being deported back to Japan, psychologists determined that he was legally sane and that perversion legally was the reason sane. behind the murder. Due to the charges against him being dropped in France, the Japanese authorities were unable to sentence him and he's remained free ever since. In the years since the murder, Sagawa has somehow become something of a celebrity in Japan. He's appeared in movies, published books, and has even written restaurant reviews for the magazine Spa. In 2013, he suffered a cerebral infraction, which permanently damaged his nervous system. He's since said that he regrets what he did in 1981. The audio of the murder was confiscated by the French authorities and to this day has never been released. Yeah. Images from the crime scene have been released and after having seen them, I strongly suggest that you don't go looking for them unless you have a very strong stomach as they are extremely graphic. Yo, my son saw a sign. Noah's Ark, The Complete Cut. God, Noah's you, Ark bro. is a 1928 early talkie film based on the famous Bible story. The film is best known for its flood scene which reportedly drowned three actors, critically injured another, and almost claimed the life of a 19-year-old John Wayne, who was cast as an extra in the scene. The actors can clearly be seen this. struggling to stay alive in the large amount of water used for the scene, and this film is responsible for putting forth stricter safety regulations on stunt scenes. In the footage you're seeing here, these people are not acting. They are legitimately frightened for their lives. When the film premiered in New York, it was 135 minutes in length. The film received harsh criticism for its poor sound quality and the aforementioned flood scene. For the wide release version, 35 minutes were cut to correct those criticisms. The longer version of the flood scene was apparently even more unsettling and even contained shots of the actors who were drowning. The 100 minute version is the only cut of the film that survives. The original premiere version hasn't been seen since its first showing in New York, leaving the aforementioned 35 minutes lost. If this footage does still exist, it's most likely being kept in the New York Film Archive and is unlikely to be released due to the on-screen deaths. The Skyway Man 
The Skyway Man is a 1920 documentary film about stunt flights produced by Fox Film Corporation. The film is mostly known both for its breathtaking stunts as well as the uncut footage of the crash that claimed the lives of Omar Locklear and Milton Elliott. On the night of August 2nd, 1920, one stunt was being filmed using the floodlights to help guide the pilots. The two pilots were operating a biplane and instructed the crew members to shut off the lights when they were getting ready to get close to the ground. They had flares attached to the wings to give the plane the illusion that they were on fire. The plane was to simulate a crash on the ground. The crew, however, neglected the directions to turn off the floodlights. Blinded by the glare of the lights, the pilots had no idea the ground was closer to them than they thought and the plane crashed, killing both instantly. Locklear's girlfriend, Viola Dana, was on set and witnessed the crash. This scene and its aftermath, including Dana's horrified reaction, was left in the film, making it one of the first films to feature the on-screen deaths of its members. The scene shocked audiences worldwide. No footage of the film is known to exist, but some production stills, ads, and photos of the crash have survived. Because the death of Steve Irwin. Oh, snap. Yo, we all know who this is. G'day and welcome to the primitive island of New Guinea. On this mm -hmm. mission, I'm going to take you from the mangroves all the way across the swamplands, up a river, into the rainforest, and right up into the mysterious jungles in the clouds. If you grew up in the 90s and early 2000s, it's That's likely right. you know who Steve Irwin is. Yeah, Steve Irwin shame, is, of man. course, better known as the Crocodile Hunter thanks to his documentary series of the same name, which ran from 1996 to 2007 and achieved worldwide acclaim, mostly due to Irwin's daredevil presenting style, whereby he'd put himself into incredibly risky situations to capture footage of numerous dangerous animals. If I can get it on the ground, on a flat level ground, I've got a good chance. Yeah, I'm... You're all right, mate. You're all right. You're all right. It means business. Snake is a good business. Oh, it's no. mouth open. This must be pretty typical to the Egyptian cobra. You're all right, mate. You're all right. You're all right, buddy. You're all right. You're okay. Settle down. <laughs> You're crazy. You're all right, buddy. I never quite realized that these two giant goannas saw me as a food source. And as I approached, unknowingly, what are you running they just Ooh. struck straight at me, going for my calf muscles, trying to pull them out. Their teeth are like razors. One bite, oh, one laceration, and I bleed out and I'm dead in an instant. Oh, shit. The Is that sharp? One laser. Yo, other dragons I would hate to be the... And they come from everywhere. Holy smokes. Guy, Crocodiles attack so hard and fast from the water's edge that their prey doesn't get enough time to squeak after they've been hit. Whack! Grabs my hand back into the Yo. water so quick that my backup couldn't do a thing about it. His teeth penetrated straight through my hand. A dangerous mistake that I'll never make again. It's Yo, that boy trying to lasso <laughs> his head. What the fuck? He also ran the Australia Zoo with his wife Terry. I would often film episodes of the show there. And welcome to Australia Zoo. Mate, every single thing you see here today, myself and my mum and dad built from the ground up. And Terry and I, well, we're just continuing the family tradition. Please, come and have a look at the things we love the most. Our animals. Let's have a look. In 2006, Steve began filming for a series called Ocean's Deadliest. Eight days into filming while looking for tiger sharks, bad weather had brought production to a standstill. Steve said to his cameraman, Justin Lyons, let's go do something. So they got into an inflatable boat and went searching for something to film. Before long, they found an eight foot wide stingray. Steve then got into the chest deep waters to interact with the stingray while Justin filmed him. Stingrays are not usually aggressive animals and are more likely to run than fight as they are very fast swimmers, so that's naturally what they expected this stingray to do when Steve approached it. However, yeah. when Steve got close, the stingray turned to face him and began stabbing violently with its tail. Oh, Lyons believes shit. that the stingray probably mistook Steve's shadow for a tiger shark, who are known to prey on them and was trying to defend itself. Lyons continued filming as Steve had told him that under no circumstances was he ever to stop, no matter how badly injured he was. According to eyewitness testimonies from crew members, the stingray struck Irwin in the chest multiple times, 
puncturing his heart, after which point he was immediately pulled from the water by his colleagues onto Croc 1, a 75-foot yacht created for the purposes of conducting both research and adventure tours, and then attempted to rush to the shore as Irwin bled out. An hour had passed before they made it to land, during which time Lyons performed CPR on Irwin, all the while a second cameraman continued shooting footage from the sidelines. Irwin was pronounced dead by the paramedics within seconds of their arrival. According to Lyons, his last words were, I'm dying. The resulting footage was handed over to the Queensland authorities, who are said to have eventually returned it to Irwin's family, who are, in turn, said to have destroyed it. Lyons, when asked about his feelings on the possibility of the footage one day being aired, said that he hopes it is never released, out of respect to Irwin's family, and also revealed that he is no longer in possession of the recordings, and that he suspects there are no remaining copies in existence. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we're gonna... She we're, yeah, she's very cute. We're gonna have to take yeah. a break right now. And then in the commercial, we're gonna see you try and get that thing out of here without being killed. <laughs> which I think okay. is gonna be really fun. All right, Steve Irwin, thank you very much for being thank with us. Thank you. Water over the show. The Dawn Brancho tape. That's crazy. Are you going to let the greedy heating companies and their crazy high prices decide if your family is allowed to stay warm this winter? Here's how a. <sighs> Gosh, do I love coming out here every day and having the audience just love what we're doing with the animals. How do I make this animal as beautiful as they are and, and have people walk away loving this animal and they're touched and they're moved and I feel like I made a difference to them. Dawn Brancho was a trainer at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida, what? where she worked for 15 years training orcas, also known as killer whales. She was known to film every performance she did with the orcas so that she could see what she needed to improve on. She became very popular at SeaWorld thanks to the Shamu show and became the theme park's poster girl. On February 24, 2010, Brancho performed a Dine with Shamu show with Tilikum, the largest orca at SeaWorld Orlando. As part of the end show routine, she was at the edge of the pool, rubbing Tilikum's head. She was lying with her face next to Tilikum's on a side out, which is a platform submerged about a foot into water. Suddenly, Dawn was grabbed by the arm by Tilikum and dragged under the water. Then she walked around the perimeter of G-Pool, he followed her. And then continued over into the uh, rocky ledge area where she laid down with him to do a relationship session, which is, it's quiet time, basically. Tilikum at some it? point grabbed hold of her left forearm and started to drag her and eventually did a barrel roll and pulled her in. He wouldn't release her, and because she was submerged under the water, she drowned. Eventually, the park's employees were able to lure Tilikum into a smaller pool and attempt to calm him down. After 45 minutes, he finally released her body. It wasn't until the autopsy that it was revealed just how much blunt force trauma Tilikum had caused to Brancho's body. As stated earlier, Dawn had every performance filmed, so the attack was caught on camera and part of the footage was used in the documentary film Blackfish, but cuts off just before Tilikum grabs Brancho. This is likely out of respect for her and her family, or because SeaWorld forbade the footage to be shown publicly. Dawn was the third person to be killed by Tilikum. His second victim, a drifter named Daniel P. Dukes, also had his attack caught on film, but this footage has never been seen and may have been destroyed. Blackfish shows other trainers being attacked by orcas, and SeaWorld's excuse for each of them was to claim it was a trainer's mistake. They also said the same of Dawn's death, meaning they tried to make it out that her death was her own fault, claiming that Tilikun grabbed her by the ponytail and that wouldn't have happened if she tied her hair back. The new plan is that what? he grabbed her ponytail. This is a subtle way of placing the blame on Dawn's shoulders. She shouldn't have had a, a long ponytail, or if she did have that ponytail, she'd have been up in a bun. Dawn, if she was standing right. here with me right now, would tell you that it was her, that was her mistake. How dare you? How disrespectful for you to blame her when she's not even alive to defend herself. There are photographs of plenty of other trainers doing exactly the same thing that she was doing. So, um, so I knew that SeaWorld was lying about the fact that this was her fault. The ponytail, in all likelihood, is just a tail. 
Dawn's death and Blackfish caused huge amounts of controversy and criticism for SeaWorld, with many people saying that the orcas should not be held in captivity and that Tilikum should be set free so that he never killed anyone again. After the incident, a new rule was introduced that prohibited trainers from getting into the water with the orcas and always had a barrier between them. Tilikum actually continued appearing in performances until his death from a bacterial infection in 2017 at the age of 35. Where does move? The Timothy Treadwell tape. If I show weakness, if I retreat, I may be hurt, I may be killed. I must hold my own if I'm going to stay within this land. For once there is weakness, they will exploit it, they will take me out, they will decapitate me, they will chop me into bits and pieces. I'm dead. Timothy William Dexter, better known by his nickname Timothy Treadwell, was an American environmentalist, documentary maker and, most importantly, a bear enthusiast. Treadwell was known for spending long periods of time in Halo Bay on the Katmai coast in Alaska, where he'd observe grizzly bears. He was known for getting extremely close to the bears he observed, sometimes even touching them and playing with bear cubs. He would often name the bears he met and was said to develop long-standing relationships with them. I want to introduce you to one of the key role players in this year's expedition. The bear's name is the Grinch. The Grinch has come on to be one of the more frequent bears here in the grizzly maze. Well, yo, wh the Grinch is a what was that? About five years of age. Oh, hi, Grinch. Hi. I really like that name. And she has kind of an aggressive attitude. Hi. If I turn around too much, she'll bite me. It's okay. Hi. How are you? Between 1990 and 2001, he'd become notable enough that he'd been traveling around the USA teaching children about bears and had even appeared on the Discovery Channel and The Late Show with David Letterman. Now, when you're with these grizzly bears, you're surrounded by them. They're very close to you. Is that how you live with them? Yes. I always give them respect and lots of room because, you know, uh, a grizzly's the boss out there. You, but you interact with them? Um, it's important that every bear knows who I am and that I fit on their hierarchy if I'm to survive. Is it going to happen that, that one day we read a, a news article about you being eaten by one of these bears? Um, no. In October 2003, Treadwell and his girlfriend, Amy Huguenard, who unlike Treadwell actually feared bears, were in Katmai National Park to study them. They were there later than usual, and at the oh, time, wow. the bears were filling up on food Them's for hibernation. Food was scarce that year due to a series of droughts, which made them unusually aggressive. On oh, October 5th, no. Treadwell informed an associate via a satellite phone call that they were What's having that? no problems with any of the bears in the area. Oh, I must hide from the authorities. I must hide from people who would harm me. I must now even hide from people that seek me out because I've made some sort of, um, I don't want to say celebrity, but... Um, they come here to Alaska and they hear about Treadwell in the bush and they want to go find him. Well, they can't. I'm hidden down below. No one knows where I am. Even I don't even know where I am. The next day, Willie Fulton, a Kodiak air taxi pilot, arrived at Treadwell and Huguenard's campsite to pick them up, but found the area abandoned, except for a bear, and contacted the local park rangers. After a quick investigation, their remains were found. Park rangers shot the bear and, upon dissecting it, discovered human body parts in its stomach. A video oh, camera was yeah. found at the site, which contained a six-minute long recording consisting only of audio due to the lens cap not being removed while the camera was on. The audio on the tape consisted of Treadwell and Huguenard screaming as they were attacked by the bear. The tape later found its way into the hands of Treadwell's ex-girlfriend, Jules Palavac. In 2005, German filmmaker Werner Herzen created a documentary called Grizzly Man, where he covered Treadwell's work in Alaska. In it, he met Palavac and was granted access to listen to the tape. While we can't hear any of it, we do see Herzen's reaction. Can you turn it off? Nah, well, y'all saw what happened, man. Ate his ass. But anyways, uh... I'm going to wrap it up here, y'all. I'll see y'all on the next episode.